May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the direction and guidance of the Spirit be with us today as we search the Scriptures, as we read from the Scriptures, and be with, with us each and every day. Theophilus was, received this message from Luke. And as Luke explains it, we now are in the time that Jesus and the disciples are going to Jerusalem. He has told them several times that he has to go to Jerusalem, and there he will die, and there he will ascend, there he will be arise, and then eventually ascend. But at this particular time, he is a rabbi that is creating a lot of excitement. Excitement for those that are being healed and hearing about being healed. Excitement for those that are coming to him for forgiveness and yet receiving forgiveness. Excitement from the majority of the people, of the, I would call perhaps the common people. But the more elite, especially the religious elite, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, Sadducees, the Pharisees and the scribes and priests were having difficulty. And so on this particular day, apparently close to Jericho, about two days of a uh, two-day walk from Jerusalem, there was a large crowd that had gathered, and they and in that crowd there were many sinners, tax collectors. And on the outside, there was a group of scribes and Pharisees. And the scribes and the Pharisees were dismayed, where they were appalled. They could not believe that this rabbi who said that he indeed was sent from God, that he indeed was the Messiah. They could not believe that this person who was creating all this, all this motion, all this, all this activity, on the part of people, that he would associate with the, dis the despairing, that he would associate with those who were under the realm of being allowed to be seen public in society. And on that particular day, Jesus decided to tell them three parables in quick succession. And he told them, first of all, about a shepherd who, upon realizing that he had lost a lamb, went after that lamb, leaving the 99, and finding that lamb and retrieving him and bringing him back. And a woman who had ten pieces of silver, who lost one of the pieces of the silver, who then could not rest, could not stand this loss, she needed to find this piece of silver, so she looked everywhere, under every crack, under every piece of furniture, and she found this missing piece of silver, and she called her friends and her relatives together so that they could celebrate. And then he moves to one of the greatest parables, perhaps the greatest parable that is given. It sometimes it's called the best short, short story ever written. And this is about, as we heard in the children's message, this is about the two lost sons and the father and the reaction of the father. There's the one thing that comes really strong in the message uh, of this parable is that the, that the lost son was brought back by his, by, by his necessity and in bringing back, he was received by the father. We do have a painting. It doesn't show up as well as I like, but we do have a painting by Rembrandt that shows over here, for those of you that are up close, you can see this individual huddled underneath the larger image on top. The father's up on top. He has these wonderful robes. And on, on, in his arms is this scoundrel, I guess you would say. He's wearing very poor clothing, and he's asking to be received. That is the prodigal son. We're not shown in this, in this portrait by Rembrandt what the other son was doing. This is at first when he was first welcome. And after this then comes this text that is our theme text. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now I have several questions that I think help us understand this parable. And one of the questions is, why were the three parables used in succession? Why boom, boom, boom? 
And why did he use the words, he was dead, now he's alive, he's lost, now he's found? Because I think they apply specifically to all people, and certainly to us and to me. Why did he use those three parables? And also, what did the Pharisees and the scribes think? What did they think? You see, the parables were told because of this understanding, this text. It goes like this. Now the, next, now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to hear him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now look at that. They were complaining. They were griping. This man receives sinners and eats with them. They were an elite. They knew the laws of, 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 of Moses. They knew how they were to live. And they lived that way. And they had a self-righteous belief about themselves. And they did not need this rabbi coming in and destroying all of this. But I also wonder, was there anybody in that group of Pharisees and scribes who heard the message in a different way? And have a story that I think shows what could have happened. There was a man who lived, he was a priest. He lived in Jerusalem. His name was Barbas. And he had a son by the name of Levi. And his son had gone on a trip to see if he could find this rabbi who was performing these miracles and healing people and bringing even people back from death. And so he went with a group, and, and the father, Barbas, thought that this was okay because he went with a group of good people. They were Pharisees, and they were scribes, and they knew what to do, and they didn't do things wrong. And so his son, Levi, went with this group of good people. And so he was waiting, waiting to see what had happened, waiting to see what Levi would say about this event. And as the door was open and as Levi came in, he caught a glimpse, Barbas the father caught a glimpse of Levi, and he thought he saw a change, something different, something bothering him. And so he didn't ask him all kinds of questions, but it welcomed him, and Levi sat down, and their servants brought in food and drinks, water and wine, and they brought in another servant, washed his feet and put on fresh sandals, and then Levi talked about what he had seen. As we approached this large group of people, I could see the scum of the earth, Dad. There were tax collectors, and there were sinners, people who had done and lived bad lives, and you could tell it. And we, that is, the Pharisees and and the scribes and myself stood off and were upset. And then I saw Jesus looking at me, and in his eyes, I seemed to be able to tell that he knew exactly what we were feeling and what I was feeling. And he proceeded to tell, Father, he proceeded to tell about a shepherd that would leave his 99 sheep and go and get one that was lost and bring it back. He wasn't worried about the 99. He was worried about the lost. And then he tells about the woman who lost one-tenth of her wealth. And she would not, this makes sense to me, Father, this one does, she would not wait uh, until it came up, but she right then decided to find it, and she found it, and then... Why did she do this? She brought in family and friends and celebrated. And then, Father, he talked about a father who had two sons. And the father was very well off. And his youngest son was a scoundrel. And his youngest son did something that no good Jewish son would ever do. His youngest son asked for his legacy, his youngest son asked for all of his riches, all what he would be given at that time. One third of the wealth. And the father, dad, 
The father did something that a Jewish father would never do. The father gave, said, okay, and gave him one-third of his wealth. And then the son went and did everything with it except what was right. And he gambled and he ran after women and he drank and all the money was gone. All of his friends were gone. And in despair, eating, almost eating with the pigs, he came back. And then the father did something that no Jewish father would do. He, he hiked up his robe and he ran. And he approached his son and he surrounded him with his arms. And he said... My son, who was dead, is now alive. My son, who was lost, has now been found. Let us celebrate. Let us celebrate. There was another son, father, Father Barbus. This other son came in as there was excitement and there was music and there was joy. And he heard this and he says, what is this? says, your younger brother has returned and your father is celebrating and, and, has, and has killed the fattened calf. And now we eat, come on in and join us. And he said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I've worked my, and my words would be, my rear end off. I've worked all of my life. I've worked all of my life. And what do I get for this? My father deserts me and awards my younger brother who did what was wrong. He didn't honor his father. And then Levi speaks to his father again, and he says, and now the next thing that happened also a good Jewish father would not do. He came out to the, the, the oldest brother, and he said, Peace, son. Your younger brother was dead, and now he's alive. Your younger brother was lost, and now he's found. Come in and join us. And the older brother said, Never, never, never. The father forgave him, and the story ends. Levi asked his father, Barbas, What does this mean? Who are we? Jesus indeed wants us to know. Someone has great love. Who is that person that loves? We continue away from that story, first acknowledging that we do not know that there was our Barbas, our Levi. First acknowledging that that is what could possibly have happened, and I think possibly, probably did, but I have a vivid imagination, so perhaps not. But I think so, because in Acts, also written by Luke, in chapter 6, it talks about how the church grew very fast at that particular time, and how many priests joined the church. How many priests joined the church. Now, when did that first start? I think it started with John the Baptist. I think it built with, with Jesus Christ. And I think it continued then with Pentecost and with Peter and with the disciples. And were led. So one of the questions I ask is, what do you think the Pharisees and the scribes thought about the message? I think most of them turned around and said, this guy is, well, he wouldn't say it that way, but this guy is crazy. I think they, they didn't believe Jesus, they didn't understand, they did not want to understand, and they turned away. And they made plots to get, a, get Jesus in a position so that they could accuse him of guilt that would create a, a, an, an opportunity to kill him. But we hear the message. And the message is for us. Now I want to look real carefully at the parable and again go through those things that this prodigal father was showed so much lavish love. And it begins this way. When we go to... The first part, the very, uh, church, verse, excuse me, verses 11 and 12. And it says this. Jesus is speaking. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. So he divided his property between them. 
that never happened before the person would die. That only happened after the person died. So this was an unusual take, a take which said to the Pharisees, as well as to all the people that were there that were listening and they were hearing, that this was an unusual gift that the Father was giving. And what did the Father get from it? Nothing. Well, after his son was broke, could not turn anywhere else, he got a son that returned. And then, what did his father, how did this prodigal son, how was he accepted by the father? Again, in a lavish way, in a prodigal way. He was accepted and said, come, you are forgiven. Put on fresh robes and get food from the best beef that is possible. And we will celebrate. And then, the older son comes in and has, I think as we used to call it, a hissy fit. Yeah, something like that. What, what, uh, what wise things people of my generation can bring back. All right. All right. Anyway, so he comes back, and, and you can see this guy, can't you? I've worked hard every day where that younger brother went and ran around with women that I would have liked to do, but I can't do because I knew that it was wrong. And besides, I wanted to get my, herit my inheritance, my heritage. And now, what do you do for me? You do nothing for me. What broke the normal rule certainly was that. But also what broke the rule, and most especially what broke the rule, was that the father, the prodigal father, then turns and goes, in fact, embraces this obstinate uh, this, this, this hard-headed, oh boy, do I see myself there, this hard-headed individual and says, give him some room, give this, understand that your money is, you, you have been with me all the time. And he said, it, let's read the scriptures. It says this in Luke 15, 31 to 30, 32. And he said to him, son, you've always been with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Wow. And so with that final statement, we have the questions. Did the father forgive both sons? Yes, he did. When we look at it, we can see so easily that the younger son is like those that stray away right away, that, that have better things to do, that don't believe in, 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 the, in the culture and in the, in the religion that they were brought up in. And the older one believes in the religion, but not in the love. Believes in the religion, but not in the love. Not in the true essence, the true heart of what love means that we receive from our Father and from Jesus and as we are led by the Spirit. And that is what prodigal love is. Excessive. Lavish. I read a, a little funny story. It's, it's got some bad theology in it. That's always good for me to talk about, right? Uh, it's not real bad. But, uh, but it's got a point. There was a pastor that in his congregation had a wonderful leader, a woman who, by the power of the Spirit, read Scripture and, and was said to talk with God, could hear God in here, and that's the one we have to be a little careful with, and could hear God and, and knew what God was saying and how to lead this group of people that she was leading. And so he thought, I better put a stop to this. And so he went to the woman and he said, I don't think what you're doing is right. I don't think God really talks to you. He says, I'll give you a test. I want you to tell me the three sins that I confessed this morning. And the woman prays and prays and prays. She looks up and she says, God says, he forgot. God says, he forgot. Wow. That's the lavish love. That God does forget. Doesn't identify us. You know, sometimes when we say, I'm forgiven, 
I do ask for forgiveness. And yes, that is true. But also with that, we are picked up. We are lifted up. And that lavish love makes us different by Christ's power in us and through us and with us. We are we receive his kingdom. And that sounds kind of, I don't know, biblical, which is not bad, I guess. But that sounds a little religious. His kingdom. But what it is, is right now. It is us. It's what we enjoy by God's grace, by God's love. It's the life we receive. It's the life that we have together. And it's the life that we share. All because of the love of a prodigal, wonderful, outstanding, exciting, unbelievable, indescribable, unlimited love of God. In Jesus' name, we say, Amen.